So how old do you think uh, Hinduism was in uh, Southeast Asia? The general idea is that, you know, Cholas, especially Rajendra Chola, uh, went to uh, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam. Uh, he took a huge navy and he went to these countries and then he converted them into Hindus. And that's when they started to build um, temples like Angkor Wat. This is what most people think. But uh, there is a place called Funan in Cambodia. Most people don't know about this place. Um, they're finding ruins, Hindu ruins, that are more than 2,000 years old. Um, oh. Yes, sometimes they're saying 2,500 years old. There is another place called Angkor Bore. This Angkor Bore is uh, uh, like two hours from the capital, Phnom Penh. Um, it's a rough place, nobody goes there actually. Um, but again, you will find Hindu ruins that are 2,500 years old. Very interesting thing, because the oldest ruler mentioned in Cambodian history books um, is not a king, it's a queen called Soma. She's supposed to be the first ruler of Cambodia and her husband's name is Kaundinya. They're both Hindu names. And so you can imagine that if Hinduism existed in Cambodia 2,500 years ago, when did people go from India? So that must have been even before much, that. Much earlier. So how old is Hinduism? So if you look at the history text, they will even say, no, Vedic texts only came like sometimes, you know, like 2,000 years ago. Oh, that's, that's, that's a hogwash. <laughs> yes. But, but we, we are now finding more and more archaeological evidence. In, the, in a faraway place like Cambodia, that's 2,500 years old. So Hinduism must have existed thousands of years before that in India. So there is a calculated narrative that's built by historians, right? Because they're trying to say, no, no, nothing existed 2,000 years ago. That they have to fit everything into the biblical chronology. Yes. Because according to them, the earth came into being only on the 6,000 years ago. 4,004 BCE, yes. in the year 4,004 BCE. So they fit everything, retrofit everything into that chronology. But uh, I believe uh, Hindu carvings have been found in South America as well? Yes. Um, I've done two countries, I've explored two countries uh, in South America. One is Peru. Peru is a very popular tourist site. It's known for Machu Picchu. Uh, it's known for places like Ollante, Tambo, big uh, megalithic structures, very large, uh, huge uh, structures. Um, most people know the Inca people of uh, Peru. Um, so what's happening is that you will find um, a lot of similarity between uh, their structures, their beliefs, and Hindu structures and Hindu beliefs. For example, you will see uh, they have snake gods. They call their snake gods as Amaru. This is the same as the Sanskrit word Amar, meaning immortal gods. And their main god is called Virakocha. It's very similar, again, to the Sanskrit name. I, I like to say Viragosha because we have Ashwagosha, Buddha Gosha, Brahma Gosha. And then they, I believe that Viragosha went from here. And that's what their history also says. Um, this Viragosha comes from the sea. So we can see a lot of similarities between um, uh, the culture we have in Peru and the culture we have in India. But nobody goes to Colombia. When I went to Colombia, because uh, Colombia is known for these drug cartels uh, because of Pablo Escobar, I think. I think he is Pablo Escobar. Yeah. Um, nobody went to uh, Colombia because it's like a dark country. But after his time, now it's open for tourists. When we went there, we found amazing similarities to uh, Hindu structures. They have one god who looks like Ganesha. He has a long trunk and the country doesn't even have any elephants. I don't think South America has any elephants. So how did they carve a statue with a trunk? So when we went into remote parts of Colombia and we talked to the locals, and I have this on tape, the locals say, no, this is a Hindu god. 
the locals say they didn't know the name Ganesha, but they said, no, this is a Hindu god. Uh, this is the Hindu elephant god. I've seen this in the movies, and we worship this in Colombia. And uh, we can see Nagas on top of lingams in Colombia. We can see Dwarapalakas guarding the main statue. So we can, and we can also see um, another uh, a statue called Swarna Bhairava. He's also known as Vice Ravana. He puts a long cylinder into the ground looking for gold. We can see all these gods in Colombia as well. Uh, now, South America is very far from India, but I think that somehow they're the same culture, they're the same civilization. We just have to understand how we went that far. Right, right. What, what do you think about the pyramids of Egypt? Do they predate Indian temples? The general idea is that, um, of course, Egypt has spectacular temples. I mean, spectacular pyramids, right? Um, um, and they're well preserved. Uh, the oldest pyramid in Egypt is about 4,600 years ago. This is the pyramid of Saqqara. Um, but we have an even older pyramid in India. This is actually in Bareilly. Okay. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is in a place called Aheshetra in Bareilly. This is a remote place, mostly nobody goes there. But this is a giant pyramid built at the time of Krishna. So it's built about 5,000 years ago. This is the oldest pyramid uh, that's older than the Egyptian pyramids. Now, if you look at the temples, you can understand that the temples are somewhat of like pyramidal in shape. But when you go to Cambodia, I've seen two proper Hindu pyramids. They're not just like temple shaped. They're two pyramids. One is in a place called Kokur. Uh, it's a giant pyramid. And on top, at one point in time, they had a huge crystal lingam on top of the Kokur pyramid. Okay. Yeah, it's, okay. it's in a forest, and today we call it Kokar. Back then, the original name of Kokar was Lingapura, meaning the, it's the yes, yes, town yes, of yes, Lingams, absolutely, absolutely, right? Yes. And there is another uh, pyramid that is also, now it's called Bakse Chamkron. This is right next to Angkor Wat. This is again a Hindu pyramid uh, built in Angkor Wat. So I think that if we explore enough, we will realize that Hindus built the first pyramids and later Egyptians took it from us. That's great, that's, that's a new information that I'm getting. And uh, coming back to the way the temples are constructed, the philosophy behind them, uh, of course it's very clear that we have the evolutionary principles built into them very deeply. So obviously they do not believe in creationism. Well, we don't know. I don't know. I don't understand um, if they fully believed in creationism or if they fully believed in evolution. Um, the main um, difference between Hinduism and other religions, like for example, Christianity or Islam, is that they encouraged all types of thought process. They encouraged it. Like you can even be an atheist or you, you don't have to go to a temple for 50 years. You can still be a Hindu. You can you can think in any terms. You can believe in one God, you can believe in 10 gods, you will still be a Hindu. So they kind of encourage all philosophies. And we should, I personally believe that we should accept all thought process, right? They, all the ideas should be able to come out in public. Um, I think this is the, this is the essence of that. Um, so we do see some uh, things like how uh, things were created. But one thing that really interests me about evolution is that there are 10 avatars of Vishnu, right? So the first of avatar is uh, uh, Matsya or fish. The second avatar is uh, Kurma or, or, tortoise, uh, or tortoise, which uh, is the turtle, right? Uh, amphibian. <laughs> yeah, amphibian, right? So, and the third one is uh, Varaha, which is a rodent. And the fourth no, one not is- not a rodent, it's a boar. Yeah, it's a boar, yeah. Uh, it looks like that. And then Narasimha is like, almost like a lion-like figure. Uh, half, half human. Yes, if, if we take it at face value, 
it gets very shady. But if you look at it in the overall fashion, the fifth avatar is Vamana or like a small human, right? It's very similar to Darwin's evolution theory, right? Yeah. So the world was dominated by fish, then the fish slowly evolved into amphibians, which is like the turtle, and then they evolved into rodents, then mammals, and then we had small apes. Like uh, they found uh, evidence of uh, people like Homo floresiensis in Indonesia. They were small, little, like human-like figures. So how does that match accurately with these, how do, you know, how do our yes, avatars? That's, uh, that's an interesting, uh, something interesting to explore further. Yes. Also macroevolution, right? Also, just by continuing that, right? What's the sixth avatar, right? That's the Parashuram, Parashuram. who's, who's mm -hmm. coming with an ax. Then the next one is Rama, who's coming with a bow and arrow. And the next one is Balrama, who's coming with a plow. And the ninth one is Krishna, who's like who's playing the flute and enjoying his life. This and is Sudarshan Chakra as well. <laughs> yes, <laughs> advanced weapon, right? So if you look at this, you can also see micro evolution of humans because humans like used to be like Parashuram. They used to just have an ax like cavemen. Then they started using the bow and arrow because they became hunter gatherers. They went from place to place and because they were hunting and then they started farming. They, they stopped moving and hunting and then they started agriculture. That's the Balram with the plow. And then Krishna shows today's man. We're not doing any of that. Actually, we're kind of enjoying, but we have advanced weapons, like we're, we're doing music, that type of stuff. So there is some symbolism there that right. we haven't fully caught, I think. We, we don't understand it fully, but how does it accurately show the macro evolution of animals and the micro evolution of humans? In All it takes is just put kurma before matsya, right? That would have failed, right? There is no, just right. one, one change in the order changes that. But it accurately fits our evolution model. That's very interesting to me. Right, right. Okay, final couple of questions. Uh, what is the position of women in the temple architectures as you see? The, the standard idea, okay, women in ancient India were suppressed, they could not come out of the house, there was patriarchy, it's a male-dominated uh, society. This is just total nonsense. <laughs> in, in my opinion, I think. There's no way, because when we enter ancient temples, we understand that this is a complete falsehood. Okay, there are more female gods than male gods. There are more female carvings than male carvings in any temples. And you can see the women, right, doing all kinds of things. You can see women hunting. We can see women fighting with swords. We can see women riding. We can see women reading. We can see women um, dancing and singing. So they were allowed to do whatever they wanted, right, and then I show specifically, in many carvings, women play the lead and men worked under the women. So the, the woman was the supervisor while the men were working at a subordinate position under the woman. So it must have been pretty much like today. It must have been, if you had the talent, it did not matter if you are a woman or a man. I think in ancient India, this was the system that followed. Okay, I, I, I personally believe that this was the system. It was an equal society where women and men were just treated equally and they got their opportunities based on their talent. Right, and you also discovered guns and bombs in the temples? Yeah, I know. This is a, um, we do see carvings of guns in ancient temples. I show this in my video. Um, it, we are now slowly starting to uncover this information because we can see carvings of people using rifles. Um, not only do the carvings show this, 
We also have texts. We have even Manusmriti, which is two, more than 2,000 years old. Even Manusmriti actually talks about guns. The guns are called Nalikas in ancient texts. Now, this is not only found in Indian texts. Uh, there is a Greek philosopher. His name is Philostratus. And he gives a completely new explanation why Alexander went back from India. Okay, what's that? <laughs> so according to Philostratus, the Greek philosopher, Alexander's army came to uh, some parts of India, and he mentions the part, this place is uh, between um, two rivers, uh, river uh, Ganga and Bias. And when Alexander's army came in, the Hindus were just quiet, but the army, when the army came close to the fort, the Hindus attacked them with weapons of lightning and thunderbolt. And the entire army just went back. Philostratus gives a new explanation saying that they were just quiet, but then they hurled thunderbolts and lightnings at us, and this caused great damage. I can only understand that as bombs and gunfire. Right. Okay, and then um, there are carvings which actually show a grenade. Like you have a grenade in one hand and you can see the pin in the other hand. Um, many people think, because we don't fully understand history, many people think grenades were used maybe 200 years ago or something like this. No, in Jerusalem, they actually found thousand year old grenades, not carvings. They found grenades, actual grenades. yes, actual grenades, which are thousand, year old, thousand years old, okay? If, because they examined the contents inside and they knew that if that thing was thrown on somebody, it would explode. So we will eventually find that ancient Indians used guns and explosives, right? I mean, we've been celebrating Diwali for how many thousands of years with with fireworks, it shouldn't be new to us. I think fireworks, understanding gunpowder should be basic. It, sh it, should, it should not be something that Europeans or Chinese taught us. Quite right. So my final question, you, you are uh, building a temple museum in Ayodhya, I'm told. So uh, please do tell us a few things about it. I'm not the one who's actually building it, but I'm on the panel to, uh, to help them build a temple museum in Ayodhya. Um, right. In Ayodhya, um, the Indian government is trying to come up with some really big plans. Uh, most people don't know about this, uh, especially the UP government uh, has a vision uh, for Ayodhya. They want to make it into the spiritual capital of the world. They want Ayodhya to be the spiritual capital of not only India, but they want it to be the spiritual capital of the world. Um, so think of it almost like Rome. If you ever go to Rome, you won't stay there for one day. You will go around looking at multiple, multiple uh, places of interest. So they want to build something better than that in Ayodhya. Um, so which is why, of course, the Ram Mandir is there. But when somebody comes from, let's say, Germany or um, Israel or something like that, they won't just come see the Ram Mandir in Ayodhya. So they want to build other structures showing the Hindu revival. They want to build uh, museums, you know, heritage centers, etc. So one thing we're trying to build is a museum of temples. Uh, in this, we want to show all kinds of information about the temples. For example, um, there is this god called Benzaiten in Japan. I don't know if you know about this. Even today in Japan, when before the kids go to uh, write their exam, they will go and like pray to this god called Benzaiten. This is a female god. She's always shown in white dress and she will be sitting on top of a, a bird. This is actually goddess Saraswati. Saraswati. <laughs> <laughs> it's still popular in, in, in Japan, but we don't know this. In India, there is no, um, we don't actually know this. This knowledge is not there. In China, they worship Hindu gods. In many countries, they worship, they just, uh, it's called Bishumon Ten. Okay, they worship gods like Gubera. 
In China and many other countries, they worship Hindu gods. They know that they worship Hindu gods, but we don't know that Chinese and Japanese worship Hindu gods. So we want to put all this information in the museum, you know, to, to see how uh, far Hinduism has reached around the world and what kind of temples were, were built, what are the types of architecture, um, uh, what is the science behind the temples. So the, there's going to be a museum that has all the highlights of Hindu temples. So that's what we're trying to uh, build in Ayodhya. Right, uh, Praveen ji, thank you for a wonderful conversation. Uh, I think uh, we've learned more about temples today than uh, we have ever done. And viewers, I'm sure you're gonna find this helpful. And this should actually set you off on a path of discovery. And do visit Praveen Mohan's channel. It's, I think, simply called Praveen Mohan. And you will find videos of such incredible content that you would probably think that uh, there's something that you've missed all your life. So thank you once again, Praveen ji. Thank you for having me. Jai Hind, Vande Mataram.